So thank you and welcome to Juicy Topics. Uh, Carol Babcock is our speaker today. She's with Topeka Jump, uh, Justice Unity Ministry Project, and she'll be discussing their work. Um, it is in the chat box for everybody to see um, the website for obtaining both information about Jump as well as uh, the Topeka housing study that has been completed and adopted by the Topeka City Council. Um, and that is on the city's website. That also is in the chat box. So Carol and her husband uh, with their children moved to Topeka about 50 years ago. They have four children, 13 grandchildren and eight great grandchildren. Um, she's a member of Loman United Methodist Church and has been with Topeka Jump since its inception. Uh, she serves on the board of directors and is co-chair of the housing committee. Uh, in, her in addition to her involvement with Jump, she's a state certified ombudsman for residents of long-term care facilities. Uh, Carol states that establishing a more just community and elder care are her passions. Welcome, Carol. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for giving us this opportunity to talk with you, chat with you about Jump. Uh, something that we truly enjoy doing. I'm just going to give you a brief overview about JUMP, including some of our current campaigns, but I will spend most of the time talking about affordable housing. Um, as stated, JUMP does stand for Justice Unity Ministry Project. We were founded in 2012, and we are a coalition of, I believe now, 29 congregations in Shawnee County. We are a 501c3 nonprofit organization and we are politically nonpartisan. Member congregations come from the north, south, east, and west of Topeka proper, as well as out into the county. We are diversified in just about every way that you can imagine. We are uh, denominationally, racially, educationally, and economically diverse people from all walks of life come together uh, in Topeka Jump to address root causes of our most serious community problems. Getting at root causes is even more important right now in the era of COVID-19. Jump is not a direct service organization. By that, we mean that we don't address people's immediate needs. We don't give out food like Let's Help and Doorstep uh, or provide shelter like the rescue mission. All of our members do those things through their congregations or through other philanthropic groups that they may be a part of. Rather, we are a direct action organization. We challenge community leaders to make policy and funding changes that will solve serious community problems, such as homelessness, violent crime, poor public transportation, mental health, and others. Coronavirus pandemic has made these problems worse and make our efforts more important than ever. We've been able to win a ride to work program called SOTO and NOTO. Most recently, we got law enforcement to use a strategy that will help gun, reduce gun violence dramatically over the next year. Locally, we're calling that program SAVE. Let me tell you a story about our campaign to increase access to affordable housing in Topeka and Shawnee County. First, we listened. Every year in the fall, hundreds of people attend small group discussions and tell us stories about their experiences with serious community problems that keep them up at night. In 2015, a common theme was high rent and terrible rental conditions. That year, our membership voted to address affordable housing as our campaign issue. We researched the problem and found that it was even worse than what we had originally thought. More than 7,000 families renting a home in Topeka 
are living in a bad situation. People tell stories about walking into an apartment with a hole so big in the ceiling that you can actually see the people who are living upstairs. People tell about houses with dirt floors. A recent housing study confirmed that in order to afford a decent two-bedroom apartment in Topeka, you must make $16 an hour. And I'm guessing that a bunch of us can think of jobs that do not pay $16 an hour. Where are these people supposed to live? In our research, we found that other communities deal with affordable housing shortages, but the ones closing the gap have implemented something called an affordable housing trust fund. Affordable housing trust funds have, fo have a focus plan that creates more options for low income families so that people are not forced to live in rundown houses. After learning these things, it became clear that the city of Topeka should establish and fund an affordable housing trust fund that can revitalize Topeka neighborhoods by rehabilitating rundown homes and constructing new ones. Year after year, we've organized as many as 1,200 people to get commitments from the mayor, city manager, city council members to make this happen. Each year, baby step by baby step, we made progress. Our best, most significant progress came in March of 2020, when the city paid for a housing study to be conducted. It, it confirmed all the problems that we had raised and the number one recommendation from this housing study was for the city council to fund the affordable housing trust fund. The recommendation is to fund it with $500,000 in 2021, one and a half million in 2022, and three million in 2023. This kind of public money will leverage serious private money for affordable housing. Topeka Jump is committed to fight for this recommendation to be adopted, and we hope you will support this as it comes up in meetings going forward. And I'll give you just a brief update about our campaigns. We are currently running four <coughs> campaigns although uh, we've just about put three of them to rest for what we can do. Uh, first, transportation. Since December of 2017, Soto and Neto have given over 35,000 rides to living wage jobs. In 2020, two JETO members. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll leave it down there. I'm sorry. Uh -huh. And our, made commitments at our Nehemiah Action to support $500,000 for Soto and Neto over the next five years. At the September JADO meeting, the motion passed for $100,000 for one year funding. A task force will be established to strategize the future of this program. JUMP will be a member of the task force to fight for long-term SOTO and NETO funding. Another campaign, violence reduction. Violence continues to be a major problem in Shawnee County. In 2019, Police Chief Cochran came to our Nehemiah action where he committed to explore a proven violence reduction strategy, GVI, Group Violence Intervention. Later that year, he and DA Kege committed to implement GVI. This became even more concrete when County Commissioner Aaron Mays committed to support funding for a GVI project manager at our 2020 Nehemiah action in August, all three county commissioners voted to put $70,000 
into a project manager in the county budget. We are beginning implementation. The county has started a hiring process for that individual. Affordable housing. The city, Topeka City Council, paid a third party organization to perform a housing study in 2020. The study revealed that one third of Topeka families cannot afford a two bedroom unit. The number one recommendation from the housing study was for the city council to fund the affordable housing trust fund. The recommendation again is to fund it with $500,000 in 2021, one and a half million in 2022, and three million in 2023. We will continue to fight for this recommendation to be adopted. And lastly, predatory lending. In Kansas, payday lenders are permitted to charge up to 391% interest on a short-term loan. 80% of the lenders reloan and are trapped into paying large amounts of interest. We are working to organize a statewide coalition called Kansans for Payday Loan Reform to fight for lower interest rates and more fair terms for the borrower. We have hired a lobbyist who will be a presence in the state house. We will back them up with our people power. And that's what I have for you. And if you have questions, I'll see if I'm able to answer them. Thank you. Back here to uh, where I need to be. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question. Uh, what are what is the city doing with? Um, I'll say the word deadbeat landlords who aren't keeping houses up to code, and how are they going to help pay for all this? Well, um, the city is trying to enforce code uh, violation reform. We do realize, of course, that there, there is a, a need for um, action. Uh, there's been some talk, uh, we're not involved in it, but there has been some talk about things like landlord registrations, where the ones who are conforming and uh, keeping their properties up to code and uh, doing the right thing would be listed and people could go there. But our focus has been uh, to creating more units that are available uh, for people. We know, I know personally of two senior citizens um, complexes or situations that have been low income and have now been sold and are going to be renting at market value. So people, uh, elders in those two communities are uh, for the most part, not going to be able to stay there uh, because they cannot afford the new rents. And some of them have been in these projects for years. So it, we just have a critical, critical shortage. Carol, we have a couple questions from um, you're, you're on mute, Mary. I can't hear. I thought I'd unmute it. Um, Carol, we have a couple questions uh, about how people in the league and people who are in congregations that aren't affiliated with JUMP can um, help with the priorities that JUMP has set. Uh, the best way is just to let the city council or whichever campaign you're interested in, and probably it would be the housing one, um, let the city council members know that you want to see this happen. This plan, this action uh, coming out of the committee that was formed to try to implement these strategies that the housing study suggested will be presenting November the 17th to the city council. You know, it would be a really wonderful thing if people who want to see this housing trust fund funded would uh, contact their city council member, 
either by phone or email or whatever and let them know that you are in support of, of this um, implementation of this housing study. Also, if anyone wants to be a member of JUMP, we're always looking for members. And if your congregation is not um, currently involved, that's okay. We can still find a way for you to join us. So, Carol, um, tell us a little more about um, I mean, the, the content of the uh, gun violence initiative or the GBI. Um, Okay, oh, I'm not on that committee, but from what I do know about it, um, this is a, a strategy that was uh, set forth by a group and it's got some acronym that I can't think of the name of, but it has been applied uh, quite successfully in some large cities and some smaller cities like Lexington, Kentucky, that are more near the, the size and situation of uh, Topeka. It, involves uh, having a person who is in charge of the program. That's the person they're trying to hire right now. And then there's a, a street team of people that actually go out and work mostly with young people who are involved in these things. What the chief of police tells us is most shootings are retaliatory in, nat in nature one group or one family or one gang or whatever uh, perpetrates violence on another one and then in order to even the score they come back so it's trying to break that cycle by having people a uh, street team of people and some of these people are previous offenders some are clergy but they're trained to go and uh, deal face to face with the kids, the youngsters, and try to say in whatever way to help support them in whatever way they need, if you will straighten up and cooperate, we don't want to send you to prison. We want you to become a citizen uh, and have a decent life, and we will help you do that. But you have to follow the you have to follow the rules and you have to do what you need to do in school or a job or whatever it is. So it's, it's a one-on-one -on -one, uh, face to face intervention with the help of the police, law enforcement, uh, trained clergy, trained mental health professionals, people who know how to interface with these folks. Been very successful. Um. So can you tell us a little bit more about the funding source for um, the trust fund, um, the affordable housing trust fund? Uh, what is the proposed source of funding for that? As of right now, we do not have one and that has been the problem uh, because grants and angel investors and people who want to donate to a cause are wonderful, but they won't sustain anything like this. It has to be a dedicated revenue source. And that's where our stumbling block has been. Lawrence, the community of Lawrence has a justice um, ministry network over there. It's, um, it's known as Justice Matters. It is under the same umbrella that we are they have an affordable housing trust fund. The citizens of Lawrence voted themselves a tax increase, believe it or not, because they felt it was so important to improve that. There are other strategies like uh, building fees and things that put uh, different uh, sources of revenue on some of the providers, some of the builders, some of the corporations. Um, there are different different ways of trying to attack it, but we want it to be a line item budget. Uh, we believe there's money to do what we want to do. Even when money is short, there's money to prioritize, money to do what we really want to see happen can happen. And in order to make our community what it needs to be for all of us, uh, you know, we feel like 
this needs to happen. Why pay people $15,000 to move here when we have people who are here now who want to be a part of the community, want to live here? It just, uh, we're, that's one of the things we're asking of the uh, city staff is to uh, try and the city manager to find a sustainable funding force source, excuse me, that will keep this going, sustain it. So, you, so you're primarily talking about um, city funding. Yes. Public funding for yes. the trust fund. Yes. And, and in order for, we have some large investors, we have some large banks uh, who are willing to put money into this, but they're not willing without a commitment from public source. Mm -hmm. It That's what the trust fund does. It leverages, we used to say $1 will leverage six. Now it looks like more, maybe nine. Every dollar of investment will attract uh, private investment that are willing to come in and put money in if they know that that public backing is there. Is there any possibility for leveraging CARES funding? We looked into that and it seems like that there isn't. Uh, we, we were hopeful that there would be a, a way to use some of that, but we've pretty well gotten shut down on that. The city seems to, uh, their legal people seem to feel that, or no, they, I'm sure they do know that they've investigated and that that just is not a, a viable thing, not a solution. Um, so we have a question about um, that someone who lives outside uh, in the county, um, and is there any way that they can support uh, JUMP, um, and they're not a, a church member? Uh, yes, there is. We, we have members, we have congregations that are, are outside the city limits. Uh, they can support it um, the same way by letting uh, officials know that they are. And some of these things, like the transportation, the problem with the transportation uh, was partly the hours of the day that the buses run, but also that those good jobs, those better jobs that are out at Mars, Goodyear, uh, Reesers, different places, Frito-Lay, are outside the city, the city limits. And that, the, that definitely is one of the campaigns that involves the county, uh, payday lending, all of these things. Our, our concerns do go outside the city limits. And yes, you can support us. And if, again, if you want to join, you know, your congregation's not a member, that, that can happen too. Otherwise, you notify your officials the same way that people within the city limits do that you want to see this happen. Tecumseh United Methodist Church, Barrington United Methodist Church are two of our churches that are out, uh, out in the county that are our members. Carol, but that means you don't have a, a, an avenue for individuals to join JUMP, is that true? No, not at all. Uh, just let us know. I have, I'm a team, what we call a team leader. So I have people that I'm responsible for from my congregation, my church that are just as uh, member network members. Three of my folks are not members of my church. So we can hook you up. Uh, one of them is uh, not a member of any church. Two are members of other congregations that are not involved in JEMP. One is a member of no church, but is interested in the work that we're doing. So yes, absolutely, we can we can hook anyone up. Okay, thank you. So the um, for for people who don't observe city council meetings, <laughs> um, they um, um, and, and our membership certainly reads about city council meetings and observer reports, but. Um, it's my understanding that um, recently two of the employers um, stopped funding the transportation project. 
Um, so can you tell us a little bit more about uh, kind of the arc of that project now, I guess? Um, well, what they, they did, yeah, they said that they were going to stop using it. And I don't know exactly how that has resolved. Uh, the city, or that is a county project. That goes to the county commissioners. They're the ones who, who voted to do the funding for uh, these transportation. Because again, as we said, they do extend. It's not a city matter. It does extend out into the county. Um, and I don't know whether, uh, I know that the county commissioners would like and we think it probably it would be fair for these companies who are using these folks who are employing them to uh, contribute financially to this program. But I think, I believe one of those, and I can't tell you for sure which one, maybe Mars, but don't, could be Mars or Target, I think were the two that dropped out. Mm -hmm. I think one or the other of them has, has re-entered. Oh. Uh, decided that they do want to use it. Their argument, I've been on several calls out to those two corporations and their argument was temporary workers. You know, we're just, well, that doesn't matter whether they're temporary or permanent. They're, they're still, they're workers. They're coming out there and working and they still need the transportation. So uh, we just, this one looks like it's pretty well settled. It's one that we will be, we do monitor uh, we do go back and make sure that these folks are doing whatever it is that they agreed to, what they said they would do. But we're pretty much where we can go with that. We've done about what we can do with transportation. Also with uh, the two others, with the payday lending and um, with the, the violence campaign, they're all pretty well underway and have passed on to the people for implementation. We're not implementers. We get it ready. We do the research. We come up with something. We uh, find the person or the group that needs to be uh, responsible for it and try to get the, the funding or the policy change or whatever it takes to make it work and then turn it over. So you will see other people's, other groups' names on some of these things. Uh, because we don't follow through. We are now because we have moved along pretty successfully with three of our four campaigns. This year, for the first time in several years, we will be doing a new campaign. Um, we don't know exactly what it will be. We just have the broad category right now, and it will be something dealing with mental health and addiction. Uh, that will be coming along here in a few months. Um, are there other questions? Um, we put the, uh, the jump website. Um, let's see, there are a couple of different websites and the, yes. uh, the League of Women Voters. And the jump contact. And the jump contact information all in the chat box here, okay. so. Um, did, did Lisa Staley's question get answered? What kinds of things do the trust funds pay for? Uh, thank you, Grace. Um, yes. What type, types of things does the trust fund pay for? The trust fund is administered by a committee or a group of people who accept applications for funds uh, they're very versatile. They can go, uh, what we are mostly concerned about is new construction. Uh, however, they can also go for things like weatherization, rehabilitation. A project would come before the, the uh, committee and would request, this is gap funding. So we're not funding any project. It would be a, a these lender or these people, uh, these developers or whatever group has all of their funding in place, but maybe they need an extra $200,000, $300,000 to complete that. Uh, affordable housing is difficult uh, because 
it's hard on the lenders that they if they can get another two or three thousand they don't have to pay finance charges on such a large loan as they would otherwise um, for example and this is something that might possibly happen at some point habitat for humanity's biggest expense and pri uh, providing a home is the concrete work because they cannot get volunteers for that. You have to have a professional who knows how to do it, knows what he or she's doing. Anyone who can swing a hammer cannot go in and do that concrete work. So it costs them something like for $190,000 or so, in many instances, they could complete a home or they could, that would be enough, they could, that wouldn't complete, but that would start it but it would be enough to complete the financing on it. So the way that that happens, I did sit in on a meeting in Lawrence where they were allocating funds and uh, five or six different groups had come in and requested funding for their projects. And at this meeting that I attended, they were allocating that. They'd already taken a look at all these proposals and they had enough money that they were able to choose three out of these five or six and they did award amounts of from probably one hundred and fifty to three hundred thousand dollars, and that was enough to to move these projects forward. So that's how it worked. There would be, um, if they wanted to, they could select a certain uh, the committee could select for a year a certain area like veterans housing or elder housing or family homes. And they could kind of focus their attention on that and look, look at projects that address those issues. But it would be a group of people, some city people, we would have a seat on it, Jump would be a part of it, some developers, uh, a committee group that would take a look at these proposals and decide which ones they, they wanted to help. <coughs> So if the city does, um, is not able to move forward with funding the um, trust fund, will JUMP continue to be involved in advocating? Oh, yes. We, this is our longest, Bryan <laughs> <laughs> and I are the co-chairs of this committee. This is our longest running. This has been the toughest one. It remains the toughest one. We've been at it for six years. Uh, when we will not quit now, <laughs> we will keep yeah. keep after. Uh, we're um, the community foundation is holding. Will will hold the funds for that. That's where it will be centered, and uh, they have, uh, you know, they can accept grants. They can accept, like we said, angel donors, things like that. But uh, we, it needs to have, it has to have, to make it function the way it needs to, it has to have public funding in it. And we will not stop until we see <coughs> that. And we have one city, I believe it might be Nashville, uh, after 10 years of work, they got $10 million in their trust fund from the city this year. Um, because of the, the huge success, the difference it's made in their community. How a home is basic to everything. These issues all overlap. You know, there's, um, there's running into everything. You can't get to work, so your car breaks down, so you take out a payday loan, and then you can't pay your rent, and, you know, they, they roll, they, they uh, overlap. But a home... There's no place like home is our motto, and that's the truth. Um, a home is basic to people's lives. Let me check the chat box here. Um, do we have any other questions? Carol, I'd like to uh, draw your attention to something. Uh, Jump may be interested in uh, what's known as Police Assisted Addiction and Recovery Initiative. Our first meeting will be November the 16th. And uh, we're gonna be meeting with Bill Cochran, Chief of Police, Brian Cole, Director of the Jail, uh, Bill Persinger and several other people from Vallejo as well as NAMI. But in a nutshell, what it is when the program is operating, uh, when an 
an addict, an addict may show up at the police department to get help with rehabilitation, bypass, right. support, everything. Anyway, I just want to throw that out. If you're interested, I'll give you the information. Okay, thank you for that. And uh, why don't you send that information to either to the jump email or to um, to my email? That I will do. I know you're you're headquartered in the Baptist Church, right? On the third. Yes, and yes. The, the uh, office is at the First Baptist Church. Right, now, that's I'm right at the hill from where I live. Okay. So I'll get that to you. That'd be great. Thank you. Carol, did you say the meeting was November 17? I believe that's correct. It, um, that was the, it's November, and I think it's the 17. It's. And was it the county or the city? That's the city. That's the city council. All right, Tuesday. Tuesday, yes. Their meetings are always on Tuesday. And that's when they will be considering whether. Whether just That's when the, the housing study will uh, the implementation uh, report for the housing the housing study has been accepted by the city council uh, they voted to accept these recommendations what they're working on now is how to implement those recommendations uh, there and there are a number of them there are five or six things that happens that the housing trust fund is the number one recommendation there's also land banks and some other things on there but that committee will be presenting its uh, findings and its recommendations for implementation of this study at this meeting so would it be good for the look our local league to send a letter uh, in support of the housing trust fund? It or? certainly would. That would be absolutely wonderful. Hmm. It certainly would. We can use all the support we can get. Uh, Well-known, established groups like the League of Women Voters, businesses that um, are well-known, have been around a while, all of those things have influence. Sometimes when the city council members tell us People tell me this or that or the other, or I've heard, it turns out they've heard from one or two people that they play golf with, mm -hmm. but they haven't really heard mm -hmm. from the community. So anyone from the community that steps up and says, yes, city council, we need this. We want this to happen. Make it go. Yes, it's always positive, and we would definitely appreciate that. So another group that might be supportive and probably you've coalitioned with over the payday loan is the YWCA Advocacy Committee. Kim Montoya was the chair. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. They probably some committee has in their research uh, worked with them, but I'll pass that forward. The uh, new, uh, Kim is no longer chair. The new chair is Tara Wallace. Tara Wallace. Tara Wallace. Okay. Um, Tara, what's your email? And I will send you her email. Okay. My email is long. It's Carol Elizabeth, all one word. Okay. 1006. Okay. At, at gmail.com. Just 1006. Yes. Okay. I think they would be interested. Um, they have yeah, we, something called the YWC Capacito, and I might suggest to Tara that she interview you. Okay. For the Capacito. Okay. Um, so, Carol, I, I want to make sure that I'm clear about what's going to happen at City Council meeting on November 17. It's my understanding that the City Council formed Housing Implementation Committee will be coming back to make their recommendations about the implementation yes. of the recommendations in the housing study. Yes, that's correct. To the entire council. Yes. Um, so I'm, um, what, they, what they'll do from that is um, um, a little bit up in the air. I mean, it's unknown to me, but um, that'll at it least be the first report from the committee. Yes, yeah, the committee okay. has been has been meeting, oh, for several months, and there was a committee before that. Mm -hmm. It's basically the same committee, but um, the, the committee before that was just to 
try to come together with all the different uh, stakeholders. Uh, the people that sit on this committee are people like Cornerstone Habitat, um, other groups, providers like that, the uh, landlords, Shawnee County Landlords Association, uh, some city folks, uh, our person that my co-chair for our committee, Steve Shuffelbein, sits on it. Uh, and that basically morphed into this implementation committee after the housing study had been completed, presented, and accepted by the city council. So that's, they will be, uh, they've been meeting, they've had some subgroups, they've come up with um, ideas and ways to implement not only the housing trust fund, but some of the other suggestions that have, have were com coming along there too. Uh, and then city council will take some sort of a, a stance on it. We're hoping that somebody will be able to get us at least a few hundred thousand dollars into this uh, this trust fund for a for seed money for a beginning. But uh, you know, we take what we can get. Ultimately, what we need is a larger amount that's sustainable that you know, you know will go on into the next year and the next year and so forth. Yeah. But, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I might point out that um, the minutes of these committees, not only the housing committee, but other uh, council formed committees is on the website. Um, the website. And, and they, they post them very quickly after the meetings too. So. Yeah, they do. Yeah, they do. They come out very quickly, very quickly. Other questions? Um, Any comments for the league? I want to thank you, Carol, very much. It's been very informative. Certainly appreciate the opportunity. Thank you.